Peyton coming up the Dropniak screen at the top. Dropniak will clear out. Peyton one-on-one -on -one on Harvey just steps up and pops in another jumper. Good golly, Peyton is on that magic carpet ride. He's very soon to approach the zone. He's not in it yet. He's approaching the zone. He has 19 points. I think that had to be Johnson, wasn't it? The cackle of Marcus Johnson. Best duo ever. All right, back to full calls. Uh, NBA season begins tonight. Third year that we don't have basketball in Seattle. So we thought we'd just want to just talk memories. What did this team mean to you? What are uh, your favorite memories? But we're getting some great ones on the text. We'll get to the sex in a second. The guy's been holding on the phone for a long time. So let's get to some of those at 286-9595. Steve, up in the terrace, what's up? The East Coast media always seem to view the 76 and 77 expansion Seahawks and Mariners as the JV teams of a city that was the Rodney Dangerfield of U.S. sports cities at the time. But in the late 70s, the Sonics were going to two NBA finals, and the Huskies were going to a Rose Bowl. So the Sonics and Husky football were originally the two consistent winning sports writers, so to speak, that gave Seattle respect as a sports town. I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, and there was, you know, there was a soundbite we found last night, and we should probably try to find it and put it back up on the on on, on the website. Yeah, George Carl, you, Josh has that. We'll fill it up on the website. It's a great reference. Do you have it right now? Here's George Carl. This is after Game Seven. He mentioned in, in the late '70s. How about what a year we had between '95 and '96? Utah battled us every game, and I'm just I'm just excited for my team, for our players. And a lot, of, a lot of stuff has been said about it in this city that's not true. And I think now we can say that. My nightmare just begins trying to figure out how to beat Chicago. But uh, it's a city that after the Mariners last September, there's a lot of excitement here. I think we'll give them a good battle. Yeah, I remember that. 95 to 96. Mariners in 95, Sonics in 96. Ah, mm. uh, yeah. I know we live in the past a lot here. And we sure. always rip Mariner fans for yeah. that. But screw it. We're doing it today. <laughs> Steven, you're next. What's up? Dude, I've tried to adjust my attitude while on hold. All right, have you? It is extremely painful. I it mean, is. I almost cried. To your produ I'm a 43-year-old man, and, you know, the Sonics, I look at them like a dead friend at this point. I mean, it's, uh, it is so hard not to get emotional just thinking about them at this point. I, you know, I loved them, and they were such a big part of my formative years. So, uh, and I guess as I sit back and I think about it, the one thing that during my time as a kid growing up, say from the, from the mid-'70s, when those guys were around, Slick Watts, I mean, you'd bump into these guys, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely true. You just don't see that, it seems, today. Uh, from that point until I left town uh, and moved away in the early 90s, the teams were, they would have, they were pretty good. I mean, they, I, that's another statement, obviously, but I mean, there was never a time when they were mediocre for too long, not until you know, the late 90s when they just, you know, when things really got bad. And so it always seemed like there were good characters on the team, guys you loved and could identify with and then and get hold of, right? And um, anyway, it's what? very it's very sad. It, it, it is. I, I, and, it, and, Steve, let me just let me wrap it up with this because, it, it, you know, what, it is sad, and I know that. And, and but what I said in, in, when, when I – the thing we put up on the website that I wrote, and I think, uh, I think Puckett and, and, and Josh and even Ashley would all agree – Look, man, they, they, the team's gone. We know that. The great thing about sports, the, one of the great, truly great things about sports would be the memories. Mm, because sure. whether, whether you know, I mean, we, we joke about sometimes how much the Mariners front office likes to live in the past, but, and they scored 21 points when it really kind of didn't matter as much, but we are still seeing some things, aren't we, with this football team? Absolutely. Each week you see a few guys that, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, you see Kafusi coming out of the, you know, out of the shell, and so to speak, or into our knowledge, and and uh, we've seen Mizell. Now the two of those young men are playing lights out, and uh, there it's just Lorenzi's starting to play him much better than we probably give him credit for on the radio, and and there's just a lot of little things going on that uh, that tell me that good things are coming, and and I will hold to that because I think I. I truly believe, and I'll be so egotistical as to say this, guys, that I think I know good football players when I see them, and I'm seeing a lot of young, good football players that are getting old fast, and that's what we need. And and, and I looked at that Stanford group Saturday, and, God, they're so big and strong and understand what they're doing. And, you know, you look across that line, there were 300-pounders, five of them, and two big tight ends. And 
we're just not physically capable yet to to take on a team that that was that strong. But we are getting better in so many ways, and you just keep watching Wilson and and you see this young freshman and all the things, and you know that there's another one named Williams in the wings, just chomping at the bit to get out there, and and uh, Ricky Galvin where the speed will need to be. And so I just I'm going to hold on to the fact in and uh, to all our Cougar fans. I hope they're being patient and understanding. Yeah, I'm tired of losing too. So just don't misrepresent that. But if that's what the process is, that's what we'll live with. Boy, Jim, and the guy that you left out, to me, besides Wilson, really, that has been the most impressive this year. And and for people who haven't watched Washington State, this is the best freshman young safety in the Pac-10, Deion Buchanan. uh, Deion Buchanan. Isn't it amazing to Mm. me? It's almost like uh, I heard Bob Robertson make a statement. I thought it was so apropos. I think I'll just put his name up here, and every time they run a ball, we'll just say tackle by Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a great statement because this young man is everywhere, and I just shudder to think if he was about 205 instead of mm. 185, uh, you'd see a lot of backs trying to figure out where number 10 is. When <laughs> You know, they always say like wide receivers try to figure out where uh, where certain defenders are because they, they go right for your helmet, but – uh, Deion Buchanan are, is just is just a joy to watch, and and uh, all these young freshmen back there, I, they're just holding up beautifully and and getting better. Washington's doing so much that people he's really doing such a good job you don't notice him as much anymore. And mm-hmm. so uh, yeah, there's some good things coming. We should mention Nolan Washington, the product out of Kennedy High School here in Seattle. You're referring to yeah, the uh, a redshirt freshman playing uh, starting cornerback. He's got a right hand now. thing. Do we know what his availability is going to be this week? Because didn't he, he did something to his hand or his wrist? Yeah, and I have not heard. I generally don't call up and talk to Bill till about Thursday because that I want to wait till after the, all the practices are over. Then I can kind of get a real true feeling of who's going to be where. But um, uh, last I heard that he was, you know, probable, but uh, n- not necessarily yet. So yeah, dis- uh, we don't know. Yeah, dislocated finger, but uh. but it appears but it appears that he'll be okay for this week. I used to say if you dislocate. Uh, or if, if one of them just located the yes, sir, I'd say, well, then tape it to the one that's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm that's not. how we used to do it. That was a training rule by Walden. <laughs> yeah, that, that, not every kid's Jeff Doolam, though, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> every kid's that guy. Uh, hey, does CJ, is CJ Mizell, does he finally get it on and off the field? Is he getting it finally? Well, I think he is, but they'll have lapses. Guys like him, <laughs> I've coached them, and um, out of the clue, Bruce guy, yeah, their mind runs a little different than the average person, so you have to kind of allow for that. But I think more lights are going on all the time um, about what his responsibility is to this team and to himself, and that's sometimes a tough lesson. Yeah. They, they, it, they don't always see what their role is to the team. Um, guys like CJ will have to understand this. Bobby had been a lot of his life always about him. Mm-hmm. And and I've had guys like this, and then they always will. They some come along, and and um, Barrington, uh, who, the young linebacker, mm-hmm. from everything I hear about the linebackers, he's very much the same way. He hasn't gotten that understanding that it's not about you so much; it's about what you can do to help our team. And too much of their lifetimes, it's been kind of half fed the fact that it was more about them. They've been treated on a it's about you basis. And as soon as they get